So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, daily tag chronology of uh, arithmetic schemes. And uh, here is a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to start with uh, the motivation. And so I will define what uh, what do I mean by arithmetic data, data functions? They are special values, and uh, I will talk a little bit about the cohomological cohomological interpretation of uh, special values. Well, I have to say that this is a really uh, deep topic with uh, with uh, really rich history. So um, I can give a really proper historical introduction here. I will just give some a few examples to just to motivate uh, all this all this stuff. Um, then I'm gonna talk about the Lichtenbaum's daily bank program. Uh, the main ideas behind the, the so-called daily bank homology and uh, the known results uh, up to this point. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some constructions and conjectures in the particular case of the special values at negative integers. And here I'm gonna concentrate uh, on my work. Well, it's not because of, uh, <laughs> of not being modest, but it's just to, to fix some notation. And uh, so um, in, some, in some sense, this case of uh, negative integers is easier than the uh, case of arbitrary special value. So, so I'm, I'm going to focus on this one. And then I'm going to um, present some uh, unconditional results. Um, basically, in my work, I developed some formalism that allows us to formally deduce uh, new cases which were previously unknown. So I will explain how to do that for one-dimensional dim schemes and for uh, cellular schemes. And then uh, I will make some comments about uh, open questions that I still have in my research. So this is the outline of, of the talk. And uh, so beginning with the motivation um, behind all this. So um, arithmetic schemes, uh, we will mean by an arithmetic scheme a separated scheme of finite type over spec z. So um, uh, the zeta function will be defined using this Euler product over the closed points of the scheme. And basically, since we assume that uh, the scheme is of finite type, uh, here these uh, uh, kx, these residue fields, they all be, will be finite. So this makes sense and um, it is really easy to show that this Euler product converges for uh, when whenever s is is bigger than the dimension of our scheme and uh, what is not known but uh, this is a big conjecture in general is that uh, this uh, zeta function defined by the Euler product actually admits an analytic continuation to the whole complex plane. So whenever we will be talking about uh, the values of this function, uh, we will always uh, assume this, this meromorphic continuation conjecture. And another big conjecture, which is uh, also not known in this uh, big generality, is that the, there is a functional equation that uh, somehow relates the value at s with the value at uh, the dimension of the scheme minus s. And here by the dimension, I will always mean the cruel dimension of, of the scheme no? in the usual sense. So, well, I hope these, these definitions are clear and probably they're known to, to, to most of the participants. No? Yeah. yeah. And can you say a little bit about this meromorphic continuation? In what generality is it known? Well, it is basically, it is known for one dimensional schemes. Uh, it is known for varieties over finite fields. 
uh, because I will I will make a comment about this uh, in, in the next slide. And also, it is known for some um, really particular cases. For instance, when X is is an integral model of an elliptic curve over Q. This is known, but it's uh, a consequence of the modularity theorem. So there are some results in this direction using modularity, but basically uh, for schemes of dimension uh, bigger than one, this, this is really uh, out of reach, totally out of reach, then the meromorphic continuation. And by, by dimension, I mean, I mean the usual full dimension and uh, mm -hmm. non-dimension of, I mean, by dimension, you mean a uh, cruel dimension, right? Not dimension yes. of uh, Z. Yeah. Okay. So basically when I'm talking about like uh, things of dim cruel dimension one, you should think about something like uh, a spectra of uh, rings of integers or, okay, yeah, yeah. or field, so yeah. Already if I'm talking about the an so relative, of, yeah, uh, relative curve, it's already of dimension two, right? Okay, yeah, I got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah. So yeah, basically these are really big conjectures: the existence of a uh, meromorphic continuation and the functional equation. Um, well, and now this is a really something that uh, probably already knows, but just uh, to put everything in context. So normally, when we talk about uh, arithmetic things, we want to work with uh, schemes of finite type over spec Z. And when we work with geometry, we talk about uh, schemes of finite type over over a field. So this will be um, this will really pop up uh, in 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 what comes next. So um, the varieties over finite fields, in some sense, uh, they are uh, a more uh, um, approachable example of this. Uh, uh, um, arithmetic schemes because they somehow live in the two worlds, right? They they are arithmetic schemes, but at the same time they are varieties. So uh, this is why some results are uh, uh, known for varieties or finite fields, and uh, the case of mixed characteristic is usually much harder than the case of uh, over a finite field. So yeah, this is basically like a small philosophical comment and uh, I will recall uh, one of the first examples of zeta functions uh, this is the dedekind zeta function associated to a number field so this is something that was studied extensively since it has been studied extensively since the 19th century uh, in the algebraic number theory so number a number field is a finite extension of the rationals uh, then its ring of integers is the integral closure of z inside f, so it's some ring O f. It has cruel dimension one, and uh, if uh, we consider the uh, uh, zeta function associated to the spectrum of O f, then this is something called Dedekind zeta function associated to to the number field f. So this formula that i wrote the first product is just the the definition that i gave before and the second formula it is it is an easy consequence of uh, results about factorization of ideals it's basically an observation by euler but um, a primordial example of these uh, dedekind zeta functions is of course the usual riemann zeta function and we recover it when we consider just the trivial extension. So uh, this is the Riemann zeta function. And um, things that I will be talking about next, uh, all these conjectural formulas involving motivic homology and so on and so on. This is already really non-trivial for the Riemann zeta function. So <laughs> it is really um, interesting to, to keep in mind this, this example, which seems somehow trivial, but uh, things are already really non-trivial for, for the Riemann zeta function. And uh, yeah, to, to relate this to, to what I already mentioned uh, before, of course, for the Dedekind zeta function, we know well the 
uh, neuromorphic continuation and uh, the function equation. This is not a big deal in this in this particular case. And uh, maybe um, for some uh, participants who are not uh, used to algebraic number theory, just some comments about uh, number fields. So. Um, uh, if you consider the complex points of a uh, spectrum of OF, then um, the Galois group, uh, the Galois group of the real numbers acts on, on these points by conjugation. And we can divide these points in uh, two different groups. So we will have a finite number of points. Uh, there will be points fixed by the Galois action, and these are the real points. And there will be complex points that will come in conjugate pairs, right? So it is, this is the standard notation in algebraic number theory. We write by R1 the number of real points and the number of complex points is two times R2, right? So R2 is the uh, number of pairs of conjugate uh, complex points. And uh, another comment, um, this will um, show up um, later so um, one case that is really approachable and easier uh, is the case of abelian number fields so abelian number fields are the fields with the that are galois extend number fields that are galois extensions with the galois group being abelian and the reason behind this uh, behind the abelian number fields being uh, somehow easier is the Kronecker Weber theorem that says that an abelian extension an extension is abelian if and only if it sits inside some uh, cyclotomic extension. And uh, basically, we know a lot about uh, cyclotomic extensions. So uh, things are always much easier in the abelian case than the non abelian case. And also, another thing that is interesting is uh, the case of non maximal orders. Uh, this is also something really classical. Uh, we can consider a ring that sits inside the ring of integers, but that is smaller as a ring that has the same rank, but but uh, that is smaller. And in this case, the spectrum of this uh, subring will be not a regular scheme. And uh, this is something called a non maximal order inside of a number field. So, for example, you can consider this this quadratic extension q with the square root of five and uh, uh, if we just adjoin to z the square root of five this is an example of a non-maximal order because the full ring of integers is a bit bigger it's uh, it's uh, this one it's uh, z with uh, one plus square root of five over two so this is just to recall some terminology and some notation from from algebraic number theory right okay so um and then, after giving this example of uh, Dedekind zeta functions, which was considered uh, in 19th century uh, for the first time, uh, we can talk about uh, a, a, a bit more recent mathematics, so uh, Hasse Weil zeta function. And this is defined for varieties over finite fields. So if we take x a variety over a finite field, uh, then we can consider this function, which I denote by z x with the parameter being t. This is a kind of a gen generating function which counts the number of points over x over different extension of extensions of the base field. And the relation of these uh, function z to zeta functions is, is basically that to recover the zeta function, we have to substitute uh, in place of t q to the minus s and uh, these functions are really interesting and they first were considered for curves over finite fields uh, and then uh, they uh, formulated uh, a list of conjectures of uh, properties uh, that uh, in general these functions are expected to satisfy for varieties of uh, higher dimensions um, for instance, one of the conjectures is that uh, actually this is a rational, this z is, should be a rational function in t, and this was proved by work. 
And in general, the full proofs of Weyl conjectures, as everyone knows probably here, uh, were obtained uh, in the 60s, uh, uh, well, during the hard work of Grothendieck, his collaborators, and, and the final point was, was made by Deline in, in the mid 70s. Right? So this is another example of these arithmetic zeta functions, uh, the zeta functions of uh, varieties of alpine fields. And yes, they, they're really interesting because they, they were like the holy grail of uh, the holy grail of algebraic geometry in the last century. So what are the special values of zeta functions? So here is the definition. We take an integer n. Then we assume that uh, the zeta function uh, admits analytic continuation at uh, s equals n, like around this point uh, s equals n. And then first, uh, the vanishing order. Uh, what do we mean by the vanishing order? The vanishing order will be uh, the order of zero at n. So this, uh, this vanishing order is, a, is an integer. It will be positive integer if we have a zero in, at n. It will be negative uh, integer if we have a pole at n, and it will be zero if we neither have zero or pole, right? And uh, by the special value, we will mean since uh, zeta functions tend to have uh, zeros or poles at uh, integers, by special value, we actually mean uh, the, um, the leading Taylor coefficient or uh, or it's it's more like the the smallest the smallest non-zero coefficient in the Taylor series around uh, s equals n, right? So this is the the formula that defines the the special value at n. And well, in everything that uh, that I'm gonna talk about, we will be interested in uh, interpreting the special values. Uh, in terms of some invariants attached to x, so this is basically the the whole idea behind this uh, behind this field. Right? So we want to interpret the special values in terms of arithmetic invariants of the scheme x. So this is the, the idea. And um, <clears throat> one mm, typical example of this kind of interpretations. Uh, in terms of arithmetic invariance is the classical class number formula of Dirichlet. Uh, this is uh, also something from the 19th century. So uh, if we consider a number field and uh, we want to know what happens with the zeta function uh, attached to, to this number field with the dedicated zeta function uh, at zero, first we know that it is well known that the order of uh, the vanishing order there will be R1 plus R2 minus one, where R1 is the number of real points, uh, R2 is the number of pairs of complex points. And uh, this is the content of Dirichlet's unit theorem that says that uh, the rank, this number R1 plus R2 minus one is the rank of the, uh, of the group of limits of the ring of, of integers. Right? And uh, the formula, the class number formula is this expression, which says that, well, we take the Picard group of uh, the ring of integers, and it turns out that this is always a finite group. So uh, we will have this, uh, this uh, rational factor. Well, in the numerator, we have the order of the Picard group. In the denominator, we have uh, the number the, the order of the torsion part in the units, that is the number of uh, roots of unity that sit in, inside our field. And then we will have this uh, real number RF, which is something uh, called regulator. Basically, it's more or less the co-volume of, uh, of some canonical embedding of the uh, group of units inside uh, a real space. So. When one proves the Dirichlet unit theorem, one constructs some some embedding, and the co-volume of this uh, finitely generated group, uh, which is realized via this via this embedding as a lattice inside 
inside the real vector space, the disco volume is the is the regulator, so it's some real number. And uh, you can you could also ask what happens to, for uh, for uh, varieties of finite fields. Well, for instance, uh, an analog for for these uh, rings of integers would be uh, curves over finite fields, and in this case, we will have a zero for the minus well a pole at zero uh, of the zeta function, and the special the corresponding um, special value at zero is is this is given by this formula. So you have the p zero of x. This will always be a final group, and we divide this order by q minus one. So this is something really similar to the class number formula of Dirichlet. Right? And one natural question that one can ask is how to generalize these formulas to other values, well, other than zero. Of course, we can write something really similar for the value at one in these cases because. There is a function equation which will relate the value at zero with the value at one. But what about other integers now, other than zero and one? And it turns out that it's already really non trivial to, to make these kind of generalizations, even for the Dedekind zeta function, for instance. So here I can't really present like all the historical development of the subject. Um, I think I will, yeah, I will uh, rapidly move to, to Mozilla cohomology. So at first, actually, people try to write down uh, formulas generalizing the class number formula, but in terms of algebraic a theory of X, and uh, but a really finer invariant which will be more useful for us is is et al. Mozilla cohomology. So Actually, it was first conjectured by Lichtenbaum, the existence of a telemotivic cohomology. So in 1994, he wrote a paper which just conjectures that there should exist some complexes of sheaves on the ital side of X and uh, whose cohomology is somehow responsible for the special values of the zeta function. And then one particular realization of this program which will be useful for us is the work of Bloch who defined in some really uh, concrete terms uh, cycle complexes in order to define higher child, higher child groups and um, actually this works also for the tag side so uh, we can consider these uh, Bloch cycle complexes as complexes of sheets on the tile side. And um, well, there is some, of course, it's not really the work of uh, Bloch because we are interested here in arithmetic schemes. So we are interested in objects that live over spec Z. But there is a subsequent work of, uh, of various people, in particular of uh, Levin and Geisler, uh, that basically shows that all this uh, block cycle complex business works fine also over spec And uh, sadly, there are really few explicit calculations of uh, uh, etalmotivic cohomology of arithmetic schemes. We don't know much about uh, about uh, about these cohomology groups. And uh, even worse, uh, we expect that these groups somehow should be finally generated, but we don't know even that. So, so basically, this is the, the bad part of the story that we can't really have uh, explicit unconditional results. We, we can have many explicit unconditional results because these ital motivic homology groups are really hard to, to calculate. I don't know if there are any questions at, at this point. Probably this is really something well known to, to the participants. Right? Hello? Yeah, I think there are no questions at the moment. Yeah, yeah, okay. But 
in any case, uh, feel free to, to interrupt me if, if something is not clear. Or... Yeah, don't worry, we will. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> or maybe uh, you just it, it, it has been just introduction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, but here I want to make a comment uh, for well, uh, for people who are used to work with uh, with these uh, cycle complexes ZM. I will be using a variation of these uh, cycle complexes, which is something like uh, borel moore et al. motivic cohomology. So, well, this is something defined really similar in a really similar way to to the to the usual cycle complex, but we consider uh, these uh, cycles. Uh, we we will index these complexes in terms of dimension, not in terms of codimension and is in the construction, the usual construction. And uh, why this is borel uh, motivic homology? This is because, uh, well, uh, borel homology in the classical sense, it is something that for, for this closed open decomposition gives us a distinguished triangle like this. So first we have the closed part, then we have our skin X and then we have the open part. Well, this is something that the borel uh, homology is something that we have uh, in the for well for classical topological spaces, but here it's it's like a motivic uh, uh, analog of this. And uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, my first question uh, about uh, uh, the choice of Z. Uh, Z is closed in X, right? Or what is it? Mm -hmm. Like this, yeah, no, 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 in the middle. Uh, Z, oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, we, yes, Z is closed in X and U is the open complement. Yeah, in which case, why don't you shift weights? Because if it is of co dimension something, then I expect it's uh, one of the uh, entries of your triangle uh, to have. Uh, Ah, sorry, sorry, no, no, uh, ignore it. Sorry. Yeah. Well, may maybe you can take a look at this formula, the last formula that, that that is here. Like this is the relation between these. Ah, yes, uh, this is the, yeah, uh, the bot yeah. the bottom. Yes, yes, because we should shift weights anyway. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, this is the last formula is for those who who I think people are usually work with with the with the usual cycle complex ZM. So. This is the relation, but this holds when X is proper and regular and when it's uh, of equal dimension D, right? But in, in general, we will be uh, working with, with things that are non proper, non regular, not uh, of equal dimension. So we want just to, to work with these complexes that I will be denoting by Z. Yeah, but uh, uh, just in case, but anyway, uh, the. Uh triangle above above the last formula uh, ad, uh, a gamma uh, z et al are you sure that the weight is n yes the weights uh, will be always n uh -huh. yes. yeah okay. this guys with compact support so there is no shift in weights in this case yeah it's okay okay yes yes but uh well if you want to 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 know more yeah, about because it's not clear that uh, the left entry is a cohomology with support uh, according to your notation. Mm, no, it's just the it's not cohomology with support. I, well, and, and you, you don't and, and you don't shift uh, uh, weights uh, if that is of co-dimension. I don't know, say one in X. Then uh, Z of N remains, uh, so you don't uh, shift. Uh, so it is anyway Z of N, but not Z of N minus one. No, it's always it, it will be always like this Z C of N. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, never mind. Okay. If if you want to know more about this, well, for those who want to know more about this. Uh, these uh, complexes Z C over N. Uh, there is a paper of Geyser. Uh, I think it's 2010, Annals of Mathematics. He uses these complexes to prove some duality theorems. 
and in particular this uh, distinguished triangle that I just wrote. This yeah, this is, a, uh, this is in fact a canonical triangle which uh, comes from uh, say uh, if u is open, say and z is uh, the complement is say uh, smooth. Assume that z is uh, smooth in x of co-dimension one, for example. Mm -hmm. Then I expected that uh, the left entry should have weight n minus one instead of n. Mm. Well, no, because I think because of this, uh, maybe the the numeration of this is really weird. So we we won't have any shifts in in the weight. No? We won't have any. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll check, but looks strange, really strange. Okay. Well, this is probably the just the matter of how we index and numerate this. No, I'm not saying about the shifts of complexes, uh, but only about the weights. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, but no, the, the weight is what we will always be. And yeah, yes. You can you can check like the Geiser's paper. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. Yeah. Uh, what what's the paper of Geiser? 20, 2010? Yeah, it's Annals of Mathematics. I think. Ah, okay, called... uh, yeah, it should be unique. Okay, I'll find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's called duality via via cycle complexes. I believe. Oh, sorry, may it possibly your question is because it is dim but not co dim in the formula. Oh yeah, this this is dimension. This is not co dimension. I mean. Uh, usually we think, I think about codeine uh, for waste in uh, Andre was serious for high for him. So it will be shifts if it will be codeine, I think. Yeah, I think uh, there is some there are some issues with the dimensions, but yeah, here uh, it's it's in terms of dimensions. It's not uh, co dimensions. So, so I, I, I sorry for interruption. I I agree. Sorry, sorry. I uh, I didn't want to interrupt. I just want to say that I agree that the. Probably there is no shift, and possibly our expectation that there should be a shift was because we usually thinking about the dimension. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there are some issues with with the connection, no. Uh, but. Um... Yeah, I think the comment was about the dimension versus co-dimension. Sorry, but uh, uh, if uh, do I clearly understand that the complex is Z C of n uh -huh. are just versions of Z of n, right? Well, somehow, but we replace usually Z of n is defined in terms of cycles of some co-dimension, and here we work with dimensions inside of co instead of co-dimension, right? Possibly because of this definition, we don't need shifts. But anyway, I'll, no, no, no. I'll check it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, here really the point is that this definition is not the same as the definition of Z of n. So this is why you you won't have any shifts in the weights of these complexes. I I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Well, ah, by the way, on the bottom, uh, uh -huh. you 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 write the relation between uh, comparing two cohomologies. Yeah. In which the right hand side uh, does have shifts. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I believe that. Uh, yeah, and think I think that this answers my question, uh, original question. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. This, is, this is what Thank I you. already mentioned, but yeah. Okay. Well, I expected this slide to be slightly controversial because this is really. Yeah, but not... for non-experts, <laughs> uh, for example, it, it, yeah, it. Yeah. It may yeah. look confusing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's. I think it's totally confusing for someone who who's really familiar with motivic homology and maybe for those who are uh, not familiar for for other for maybe some other 
listeners are not so familiar with this stuff, so you can forget about this and just we will be working with these uh, complexes Z, C of N, right? Mm. So yeah, I think we can move on now. Um, so, um, cohomological interpretation of uh, vanishing orders. So, um, we consider first this case of uh, the Dedekind zeta functions. So, we consider a number field. And, uh, well, um, Borel in, in 1974 made calculations of ranks of the algebraic K theory. But basically, these calculations of, uh, of the ranks of uh, algebraic K theory of, uh, of rings of integers gives us uh, a similar result for the rank of this particular group. Uh, so uh, this, the, the, uh, this uh, version of uh, etal motivi cohomology, this uh, ZC uh, version, uh, will have a, the only the only non-trivial rank of these groups will be in case of n uh, less or equal than to zero. The only non-trivial rank will be in degree minus one, and here this the rank will correspond precisely to the vanishing order of the zeta function. So it will be r1 plus r2 minus one if n equals zero, which is something I already mentioned. And then at uh, uh, strictly negative integers, it will be either R1 plus R2 or R1, depending on the parity of uh, N. So this already tells us that this uh, special value business has something to do with motivic cohomology. So this is an explanation uh, about the relation for the vanishing order, right? Um, yeah. And um, so uh, what can we say about the special values? So this is, this is uh, the general conjecture that one can uh, pose about the, the, um, the special value. So with, well, this, this, with this uh, particular numeration of these uh, cohomology groups, we'll have uh, one group which will be finite in degree zero, and uh, another group which will be finitely generated in degree minus one. So we take the here the torsion part of this uh, finitely generated group, and uh, here we will all, all, always have we will also have some uh, regulators which will be real numbers, and um, well, it's uh, it's kind of difficult to define. The, the regulators. So this was first uh, made by Borel in the case of algebraic theory. Then also Bailinson gave uh, more general definitions. And we will be interested in the regulators for the motivic cohomology. And uh, basically this is, um, in this particular case of uh, number of fields, it will be this thing. So there is some canonical mapping from the, this group uh, in degree minus one, which will have rank corresponding to the vanishing order. And then the target will be what I wrote. It's, it will be some um, real vector space of, of the same dimension as the rank of the, of the source in this mapping, right? So this is some canonical realization of the, of the free part of this, uh, of this, uh, finally generated group as a lattice, and the co-volume of this lattice will be the regulator, right? And uh, the conjecture that I wrote, this is known for the case of abelian extensions, but this is already not so trivial. It was uh, established, I think, in 2002. So this is, this is a really complicated work, which involves reduction of this kind of conjecture to to the Tamagawa number conjecture. And, um, but using these reductions, we can prove that for abelian extensions, this formula that I wrote is, is uh, correct, right? 
And the conjecture is that this all is also correct for non-abelian extensions of Q, right? And uh, also this formula that I wrote, sometimes it is called Licht co cohomological Lichtenbaum's conjecture, because first um, it was some similar formulas were written down by Lichtenbaum in 1973. I think in the proceedings, in these proceedings uh, about higher K theory, there is a um, there is an article of Lichtenbaum where he writes down formulas uh, where he uses instead of motivic cohomology he uses um, higher K theory, and also he treats the case of uh, real extensions and uh, odd uh, n because in this case there are no regulators. You know? This is kind of easier, and then. Uh, uh, the regulators become non-trivial in other cases. And uh, it was Borel who, who came after and who considered uh, these kind of formulas in terms of K-theory, but uh, writing down uh, some uh, higher regulators for this for the number of field case, right? So basically, this is the another formula, which is which is known for abelian extensions and then in general this is still a conjecture right um so this is an example of a cohomological interpretation of uh, special values uh, for for this particular case okay and uh, the case of varieties over finite fields well we can also consider as before the negative integers well, in this case, the zeta function has no zeros nor poles in, in, in the negative part. And then if you assume that these groups, that these motivic cohomology groups are finitely generated, then we will have these kind of formula. So the value at uh, n will be just some, it's some alternating product in the sense that orders of some of these uh, groups will be uh, in the numerator and of others in the denominator. Mm, well, it, it depends on the parity of, of the degree. Right? And um, yeah, basically assuming that these groups are finitely generated, it is also possible to deduce from there that these groups will be actually finite. And the formula will, be, will look like this. And basically the reason behind this formula, this formula, suspiciously looks like the Grothendieck dix trace formula for, well, for the eladic homology. So basically it's the trace formula, somehow this, this what I wrote down is, follows from the trace formula plus, plus epsilon, right? And uh, uh, if you want to ask what happens to, to the positive uh, integers, this is actually more difficult. So I think, one of the first uh, articles treating this uh, this uh, kind of stuff is is the work of Milne from 1986, and then well there are there are a lot of uh, subsequent works, and I will mention some of these uh, later. Well, basically the case of varieties or finite fields is is somehow easier than than even the case of um, of uh, of number of fields, right? Well, but here we still have to assume that we know finite generation of this motivic homology, and this is something that is not known in general, right? So these words assuming that these groups are finitely generated is, is really some strong assumption, right? Um, okay, so I don't know if you if there are no questions about this uh, introductory motivational part, so maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, bilateral cohomology, right? So mm, what is uh, bilateral cohomology? First, I, will, I would like to mention some conjectures of Lichtenbaum with respect to the uh, structure of these motivic cohomology groups for uh, schemes over spec Z for arithmetic schemes. So um, the first conjecture says that uh, these groups will be up to some point, these groups are finally generated. 
And then after some point, these groups are what I call groups of cofinite type. And cofinite type means that these are QZ dual to, to finite degenerate groups. And the reason behind this uh, appearance of uh, QZ dual to finite degenerated stuff is, is because of arithmetic duality theorems. So there is mm, a classical arithmetic duality for a telecomology for uh, rings of integers. It's uh, by Artin and Verdier. And there is some, there are some higher dimensional generalization of this arithmetic duality. And this is because of, it's because of that that we will have this QZ stuff inside, inside uh, of uh, motivic cohomology usually. But here, one, one important comment is that if we take N strictly negative, then uh, with this weight, we, we, with this weight, these cohomology groups, actually one can deduce from these conjectures that I wrote that these groups actually will be all finite degenerated. There will be no this cofinite type part because somehow it will it will be trivial, right? It will disappear. So um, another important um, conjecture about this motivic cohomology is that. We know sorry, that can I have, uh -huh. sorry, can I have a question, please? Yeah, uh, before formulating something for negative weights, one should define what you mean by them, uh, by uh, negative, uh, negative weight. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, yeah, uh, this is when we come back to, to the previous discussion. Uh, yeah. Like, this is, this is the point of working with these complexes because uh, it makes sense to consider negative n. If you if you want, you can take a look uh, at this relation to the usual complexes. So I here see. Is okay, thanks. Yes, I see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for this question because I think maybe now it's it's clear uh, what this negative weight means and why we work with this uh, weird uh, variation of cycle complexes. Yeah, exactly. This is why we work with them now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, I think hopefully we sorted out now the con controversy. <laughs> so yeah, like these complexes, they make sense in negative weight. Yeah. So this negative weight response in the classical uh, setting to the weight above the dimension, right? Yeah, it will be the if you want to relate these to the to the usual uh, cycle complexes, the weight will be d minus n, but where d is the dimension of x, right? So uh, this is why it makes sense to to take negative n in this case. Yeah. Thank you very much for for the question. So um, and another important conjecture is the Bellinson Soule vanishing conjecture, which says that uh, in negative degrees, after some point, these groups will be all trivial. And uh, also one important comment is that in general we can't say that this complex is that this cohomology is bounded so in general we will have some non-trivial cohomology in arbitrarily high degrees right so basically the point of this uh, slide that i showed is that um, first of all the motivic cohomology for arithmetic schemes is not literally finitely generated because it can be co-finitely generated well, it is expected at least to be, right? <laughs> and uh, also this cohomology is not bounded. So these are two issues one somehow has to deal with, right? And uh, well, before uh, um, talking about very cohomology, maybe a similar uh, list of conjectures. It's also due to Lichtenbaum. It's uh, a more precise conjecture about uh, these cohomology groups for varieties over finite fields. Uh, Lichtenbaum conjectures that uh, all of these cohomology groups should be finitely generated with two exceptions. There will be two degrees. In one degree, one expects a finitely generated group, and in another degree, one expects a group of cofinite type. And uh, if we take negative weights, then uh, from these conjectures, one can show that uh, we expect that these groups are actually 
uh, finite finite groups. Okay. And now uh, the lethal cohomology. So the idea is well, roughly the idea is the following. Uh, somehow the lethal cohomology is is expected to be some modification of etal motivic cohomology. So um, the lethal cohomology are certain groups. Well, here this notation W means the lethal and C is compact support. So one expects some mm, modification of etal motivic cohomology uh, that gives us finally generated groups and also that is bounded. So these cohomology groups should be trivial for for uh, for big enough uh, degree, right? Or small enough degree. And another important property is that one expects that these groups, if we forget about the torsion part in these groups, if we, for instance, tensor this with R, one expects that there is a, a long exact sequence of these groups after tensoring them with R. So here, this uh, this is denoted by the cup product, which, well, in in reality, is actually some kind of cup product that gives us there is some canonical class theta and cup product with this canonical class gives us somehow uh, elements in the higher degree and a longer sequence of these uh, cohomology groups. And um, these cohomology groups are supposed to encode in some sense the um, vanishing orders and the uh, special values of the zeta function. Well, this this is just a comment like why it is called the lethal. This is because um, this because in the case of a variety of our finite fields, there is some construct part, some explicit construction of these cohomology groups, and basically we have to take the motivic cohomology of uh, x over the algebraic closure of q, and then we consider the action of the veil group of the finite field uh, fq which is just the subgroup inside of the gala group generated by the Frobenius. So because of this appearance of the veil group of, uh, for the case of uh, varieties of finite fields, this is, uh, this is where this-, uh, this hey, Can I have a question? Uh, huh? Can I have a question? Uh, this, uh, for this complex for a gamma, what does it, uh, what does it compute? Just uh, a stupid question. So this uh, this uh, complex of abelian groups recovers what? Oh, the motivic cohomology like H I blah 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 Z C N. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe maybe I have to also to, to mention this that well I will be writing R gamma for uh, really often for complexes that calculate the corresponding cohomology, right? And this R gamma G. This is the usual group cohomology because we will have the uh, the action of the Galois group on the on this uh, cohomology, right? Yes, yeah, I understand. Just uh, just to uh, be consistent, what uh, this complex uh, compute because nothing yeah, right. was said about this. Right. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> and um, actually, uh, from the very beginning, Lichtenbaum was considering a special growth indic topology. So. One expects that actually there is a veil lethal topos that these groups are not some kind of ad hoc objects, but instead there is some real geometry behind them, and there is a, like a veil lethal topos which is responsible for this uh, veil lethal cohomology. But this is a really difficult topic, so I'm not talk about veil lethal toposes in today. I think, yeah. I won't be able to, uh, I won't have time. So um, I will mention some results about this uh, Veletal cohomology. So what do we actually mean by a result in this case? So first, it is really a non-trivial task to, to define these groups. So first step would be to define these groups, assuming Lichtenbaum's conjecture on the structure of the uh, etal motive cohomology. Then, one should formulate the precise relation of these cohomology groups to the vanishing order and to the special value of the zeta function. And then uh, one 
well, normally one relates these conjectures to other previously known conjectures, and hopefully one proves some new particular cases uh, that were not known before, right? So this program was initiated by Lichtenbaum, and first he considered the case of um, finite fields. Then Geyser also wrote a series of papers about uh, Veletal cohomology for varieties or finite fields. And um, he also worked with uh, varieties that are not uh, necessarily smooth, but um, this is, well, um, it's, uh, it's a long story, but uh, um, for non smooth varieties over finite fields in general, Geyser defines the e e h topology, which is uh, ital h topology, which is like similar to this uh, c d h topology and and so on and so on. But I won't. I think I won't talk much about this. Um, Lichtenbaum considered then the next uh, case, uh, natural case that would be the case of uh, uh, the ring of integers. Uh, then Baptiste Morin considered generalized uh, this work to proper regular arithmetic schemes and he considered the particular case of the special value at zero but actually this case of the value at zero already contains uh, most of the important um, parts of the general theory and then uh, Matthias Flach and Baptiste Morin they generalized this work to any arithmetic uh, scheme that is proper and regular and to the special value at all the integers and um, i will be talking about 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 my work and my work it was uh, suggested by baptiste moran to uh, think about their constructions and uh, try to remove these uh, these uh, assumptions that x is proper or regular so consider any scheme that is uh, separated, just separated in, in a finite type of FXZ. But actually, this is kind of uh, difficult. So one considers uh, this case of N uh, strictly negative, and somehow this makes life easier. So there are things that make life harder, uh, removing the nice assumptions on the scheme. But then there are also this this uh when we really talk about uh, the weight uh and strictly negative then it will be somehow easier to uh, to make the construction so so this is basically the the last point is uh, something i will be talking about okay so um, here i will give some ideas behind these constructions and conjectures or strictly negative uh, weight M. So, Veletal mm, complexes. So, we take a scheme that is uh, an arithmetic scheme separated in a finite type over spec Z. Then we take uh, N strictly negative. And then we assume uh, a conjecture uh, that these motivic cohomology groups are finitely generated for all I. And then, under this assumption, it is possible to construct uh, these varietal complexes. Uh, well, this R gamma, this means that it will be some object in the derived category considered in some ad hoc manner uh, using using the the complexes that calculate the etal motivic cohomology. And uh, these complexes, uh, they will be perfect complexes in the sense that the cohomology groups of these complexes will be finely generated groups and also they are bounded and uh, we can make this more precise this group will vanish outside of this interval from zero to two times the dimension of x plus one okay and um, well here i will not talk about the precise construction of these complexes because it is somehow involved and it's uh, too technical and for, 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 for a seminar talk, right? I will talk about some, I will mention some properties of these complexes. 
So first, in the case of varieties over finite fields, we can show that these valid cohomology groups will be QZ dual to these uh, um, motivic cohomology groups. But actually, I already mentioned that under these finiteness assumptions, all these groups that I have on the right hand side, they, they will be just um, finite groups. So these, all these groups will be just finite groups. And this will, they will come from the uh, um, et al motivic cohomology of, uh, of X in this case. And also one can uh, show there is a, some duality result that uh, these will be also, will also coincide with some uh, uh, cohomology of compact support defined for these sheaves that are basically like the sheaves of all roots of unity of order that is not divisible by p right what this is what i what i what i have this like this qz prime sheaf is just a sheaf of all roots of unity uh, of order uh, that is not divisible by p which is the characteristic of uh, of uh, the field of the base field so this so uh, can i can i have a question uh, mm -hmm. the while cohomology with supports always torsion therefore Yeah, but this, like this, what I have on the right hand side is just some co limit of the. So this makes sense for to consider the cohomology with compact support in this case. Yeah, the while cohomology with compact support must be torsion abelian groups in the end. Always. Yes. In contrast with, I think, uh, other versions say for motivic cohomology yeah but here we will just have some finite group so this will be like three really torsion of course yeah. all these groups that that are that appear here actually they will be finite okay thank you yeah i mean this is not obvious at all but Actually, the, yeah, this, as I wrote, these groups will be all finite groups in this case. And actually, like, of course, when I write this QZ dual to a finite group, this is because of some reasons of uh, canonicity and contoriality, right? But uh, at the end, these are just uh, finite groups. And then it is also easy to understand what this uh, Veletal uh, cohomology means when we forget about the, um, the torsion part. Because if we tensor these complexes with Q or with R, as I wrote here, then this complex will just split into two parts that are somehow easy to understand. So this first part will be just dual to the complex that calculates the um, the, the etal motivic cohomology. And there will be the second part, which calculates what I wrote here. It's the, basically it's the, um, cohomology of the complex points of x but we take these uh, coefficients with uh, weight n and we take also the invariance with respect to the galois action on the on these uh, on the resulting cohomology groups right so yeah so basically the point is that um, if we forget about the torsion part then it is easy to understand what this veletal cohomology is it's some kind of uh, it will be just a combination of the etal motivic cohomology uh, tensor with with q or with r if you like and then there will be also like these groups that are uh, that come from the cohomology of the complex points of our scheme so it's kind of easy to understand uh, what we expect from the ranks of these groups. But uh, the torsion part is really, it's, it's really sophisticated. And uh, this is why I'm not talking about the general definition of this uh, complex R gamma WC, okay. Um, I think I will mention one ingredient that appears in the construction. So this is an arithmetic duality. Uh, so one can show, one can show that there is a duality of this form so basically it's uh, 
it's a duality that comes from the results of uh, Geyser. And uh, here, uh, well, what, what does this mean? So if we take the, uh, uh, these motivic cohomology groups and then we take uh, QZ duals to them, then we have the cohomology with compact support uh, with respect to this uh, complex Z prime N. But this, what I wrote, it's actually, it's, uh, it will be also some kind of co-limit of uh, shifts of roots of unity. Uh, well, here I take uh, these uh, shifts of roots of unity. I take, uh, I take the, um, uh, the extension by zero of these uh, shifts with respect to this uh, canonical localization, canonical open immersion, right? When we localize at P. And then I take the co-limit of this, of this stuff. So, and one can show that actually this, uh, there is a QZ duality between uh, motivic, this et al. motivic cohomology and uh, uh, cohomology with compact support of, uh, of these uh, sheaves. And um, well, in this case, uh, there are some technicalities, like for instance, instead of considering the uh, et al. cohomology with uh, compact support we have to consider a modified total cohomology with compact support but um, yeah i think uh, i won't i won't enter into the details on, on this one right so basically this duality it's a higher dimensional generalization of uh, this classical uh, arithmetic duality like art in their duality for uh, for the rings of integers and um, this result is it's a consequence of that paper of Geyser that I already mentioned before. So this duality, it's uh, somehow, it's, it's the principal ingredient in the construction of this uh, daily technology. But I think I won't talk uh, much about this because already I, I think I, yeah, I don't have too much time, I think. And now I will talk about the regulators, because before I mentioned that uh, there are some regulators that appear in the um, in these special value conjectures. So we have to also connect these cohomology groups to the regulators. So um, I think uh, the state of the art uh, regulator construction that is uh, that can be used in this setting is is the construction of Kerr Lewis and uh, Mueller stuff. So they define a regulator which will be it's it's uh something that will be defined on the um this complex that i wrote is the complex that calculates uh uh this etal motivic homology but this complex tensor is r and then it it goes to to r dual of uh, homology with compact support of the complex points of x and uh, what is important about the regulator is that uh, one of the conjectures uh, of Bailinson in, in, in this situation that we consider, um, it will come, come down to this statement that uh, this uh, regulator map, uh, it, is, it gives us a quasi-isomorphism. Uh, basically, I write this uh, taking the duals, so we will have some map that goes from the cohomology with compact support uh, of the complex points of X, well, with uh, invariance uh, with respect to the complex conjugation. And then it goes to the complex dual to the um, um, complex that calculates the, the uh, etal motivic cohomology, right? So one conjectures that these uh, this is a quasi isomorphism of complexes. That is, uh, the corresponding dimensions of the cohomology groups should coincide no? as uh, real vector spaces in this case. And um, okay, now I will formulate the vanishing order conjecture. This is really easy. So the conjecture is the following that the vanishing order of the zeta function at uh, n. Uh, is given by this formula involving the ranks of these uh, volatile cohomology groups. So it's all, it's something like the Euler characteristic, but it's uh, taken with these uh, weights uh, i. Um, 
And then if we assume this uh, regulator conjecture, actually we can rewrite, re rewrite this formula as, as something more understandable. So we can write this down as, a, as the usual Euler characteristic of the, um, this uh, cohomology with compact support, uh, this equivalent cohomology of compact, with compact support of the uh, complex points of X. Or we can write this down as the uh, shifted Euler characteristic of uh, just this um, uh, etal motivic cohomology that we are working with, right? And uh, this first formula that I wrote, uh, this uh, first interpretation, this is actually something that agrees with the uh, hypothetical conjectural functional equation. Um, basically, the meaning of this uh, of this formula is the following: that, uh, as always, we are considering these uh, values at negative integers, and uh, the functional equation will tell us that all the zeros and poles just come from the gamma factors, and this stuff of like uh, related to this equivariant cohomology of the complex points, this is uh, something that one can deduce from the uh, conjectural functional equation. And uh, the second formula, which is probably more interesting, uh, is uh, actually uh, a conjecture of Soule. He wrote down a conjecture. I think uh, he first formulated it in terms of K prime theory, but you can also, there is also like a reformulation in terms of uh, Borel Moore uh, motivic cohomology. So um, basically, this, this second formula is a conjecture that, uh, that is due to Soule that the vanishing order of the zeta functions should be uh, this uh, uh, related to, to the motivic cohomology uh, like this. Okay. And now I will just give a toy example of how this works. So if we consider the case of a uh, number field, uh, then we have these uh, real points and we have complex points. We can write down uh, the complex that calculates the uh, uh, cohomology of these uh, points, but of course it's like just a discrete space, so it will be something really easy. And then we want to can calculate this equivariant cohomology. So this is basically in this case it's an exercise. Calculate what does this mean to take the equivariant uh, cohomology of the complex points of this. Uh, of this uh, scheme, well, the complex points will be just uh, a discrete space. There will be some sp specific action of the conjugation on this uh, complex. And if we calculate this stuff, we will recover these numbers R1 plus R2 and R2. And uh, magically, these are precisely the, the vanishing orders for the Dedekind zeta functions that, that we already know from the algebraic number theory. So yeah, this is like to show uh, how these formulas for the vanishing orders work, okay? And uh, now I want to formulate the um, special value conjecture. And this is kind of hard to formulate what does this mean? Um, well, I don't know, maybe uh, some of you are already familiar with uh, determinants of complexes. Uh, but I included like a quick uh, review. So it is possible uh, to define what does it mean to take the determinant of a perfect uh, complex um, of uh, R modules. So a determinant of a, of a complex uh, will be just some invertible R module. And also, if we have a quasi-isomorphism between uh, complexes, uh, this construction will give uh, canonically some isomorphism between the corresponding determinants. So um, I wrote here like the, it's basically, this is the definition. So um, yeah, well, probably I have to, to skip all these details, but um, it is possible. Well, basically, the idea is to, to give a canonical construction of uh, uh, determinants of uh, complexes. And this is something that was made by Knudsen and Mumford in 1976. So it's something classical. 
and um, basically uh, using this uh, determinant business uh, first uh, we consider uh, some uh, morphism of complexes uh, using the regulator map and then if we assume this uh, regulator conjecture uh, we can show that uh, using this formalism of determinants basically the determinant of this complex that we have at the beginning this will be just canonically isomorphic to r and then we will have the determinant of the complex of the right hand side so this will be canonically isomorphic to the um, tensor product of the determinant of uh, of this integral complex tensored with r so um, this is basically the idea is the following right so this complex r gamma wc it's a perfect complex of abelian groups so its determinant is actually just a um, z module of rank one so it's uh, just a uh, invertible z module so it's a z module of rank one nothing really interesting but uh, this determinant business uh, gives us a canonical isomorphism between r and this uh, z module of rank one tensored with r so basically this is the uh, what 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 is important about this slide and the previous slide so yeah i think uh, we can move on maybe so <clears throat> this is the idea so we take a canonical isomorphism between uh, uh, between uh, this determinant tensor with R and the real numbers. And then we formulate uh, the special value conjecture using this thing uh, as follows. So um, we assume that uh, the um, etal motivic homology is finitely generated. We assume that the complex fiber of our scheme is smooth in order to uh, use the regulator construction. Uh, then we assume that the regulator conjecture holds that the regulators gives us give us uh, quasi isomorphisms as expected and then we assume that there is a meromorphic continuation in, uh, around the s equals n so then one can formulate the following conjecture so we conjecture that the special value of the zeta function at s equals n will be determined up to sign by this formula. So what does this mean? So this thing is, is like a real number. It's just the inverse of the special value that is that we uh, are interested in. And the right-hand side is a um, Z module of rank one. No? But we conjecture that uh, under this canonical isomorphism that I wrote above, uh, the generator of z inside r will be precisely will correspond to this uh, uh, special value so this way we like uh, canonically uh, canonically embed z into r into the real line and then we uh, conjecture what is the generator of z well and basically this will uh, since we choose it a generator we will recover the special value up to sine plus or minus one yeah i don't know if there are questions uh, at this point Well, basically, it's like a really uh, maybe it really looks sophisticated all this machinery, but it's to connect uh, the regulators to everything. We use these uh, determinants of complexes, and then so basically this uh, this uh, lambda, this uh, canonical isomorphism lambda, it's it's just some machinery that will uh, hide, uh, will sweep un under the rug the the the, the, regula the regulators. Okay? So basically, this is the the special value conjecture, and I think I will give some examples in what follows. Uh, it will be more clear. So if we consider the varieties of finite fields, then in this case, this special value conjecture is just equivalent to this formula that I already wrote before. So it's just some alternating 
product of orders of these uh, uh, ethyl motivic cohomology groups. And uh, there is no regulator because in this case, well, the regulator is defined in terms of the complex points of X, but X lives over a finite field. So there is, it's trivial. And uh, just to give some example of how this for formula works, we can consider, for instance, a singular um, curve. Here I took the, the node. And we can calculate the, these motivic homology groups in this case. So there will be one group in degree minus one um, of this order Q to the one minus N minus one. And then there will be groups in degrees zero and one, but they will have the same order. So when we write down this uh, formula, the above formula in this case, uh, these uh, cohomologies in degrees zero and one will cancel. And then we, on the other hand, we can check what is the zeta function. So in this case, it is easy to see that the zeta function of this, uh, of this variety will be one over one minus Q to the one minus S. And then if you substitute M uh, in place of uh, S, you can see that this is up to sign, up to sign it precisely will coincide with what the formula mean, gives us, right? So the formula predicts that it's uh, plus or minus one over uh, uh, Q to the one minus N minus one. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. This, there is a mistake in this slide. Here, of course, this alternative product, it has to be plus or minus one because the conjecture that I formulated is up to sign. So the, this, this holds up to sign plus or minus one. Okay. And actually one can show that if we assume the finite generation of uh, motivic homology for this case, then actually this uh, special value conjecture, it, it just holds uh, automatically for any variety of finite field and for negative uh, values. So this is the case of uh, varieties over finite fields, which is really easy. And um, then what is interesting about this uh, conjecture is the following. Uh, so if we consider the case of, uh, well, this is something really easy. First, consider the S an arithmetic scheme X that is a finite disjoint union of uh, some arithmetic schemes. Then on the level of uh, zeta functions, it is clear that the zeta function of the union is just the product of the zeta function of each piece. And accordingly, this uh, vanishing order conjecture and the special value conjecture, they will be just equivalent to the uh, conjunction of these conjectures for each piece of, the, of this disjoint union. Well, this is not, not so difficult. Then one can also show that um, if you have this uh, close up scheme Z and it's uh, um, open complement U, then in this case, the zeta function decomposes into the product of uh, the zeta function of Z and the zeta function of U. And one can show that in this case, uh, also these conjectures, the vanishing order conjecture and the special value conjecture, they are already, they are. Um, also compatible with these uh, closed open decompositions in the sense that if we assume three, two out of the three conjectures for one for X, for Z and for U. So if two out of three holds, hold, then the third one holds as well. So in this sense, these conjectures are compatible with uh, open closed decompositions. And uh, also uh, there is a formula for affine bundles. If we take a, uh, our scheme X, then we have a, an affine space over X of some dimension R. Then there is this relation between the zeta functions. And uh, we can show that actually uh, these conjectures, they satisfy the same compatibilities. So the conjecture for the affine bundle over X at N is equivalent to the uh, conjecture for X at uh, n minus r so so basically this is uh, one of the important properties of all this uh, machinery that uh, these conjectures they satisfy the the properties that they that 
are somehow expected because the zeta function are clearly from the definition one can see that they are compatible with these these joint unions uh, closed open decompositions and affine bundles and uh, the our conjectures um, turn out to be also compatible with all these basic operations on schemes um, okay Oof, so uh, basically the last part will be uh, I will give some particular formulas and particular examples that explain how I use all this stuff I was I was talking about. So uh, one particular case that I want to consider is the case of one-dimensional schemes. So we consider a one-dimensional arithmetic scheme, and then uh, we will say that this scheme is abelian when uh, if we have a generic point of uh, zero characteristic zero, then this extension of the residue field over Q is an abelian extension. And in this case, uh, one can show that uh, this uh, vanishing order conjecture and the uh, special value conjecture, they hold unconditionally for any negative N and for any abelian uh, one-dimensional uh, scheme B. And this is not so difficult to show uh, because uh, this we use as a as the input that this is known for uh, for the case of the number rings and for the varieties of finite fields. Well, for the number fields, we have to assume that uh, the extension is abelian. Otherwise, it is not known. But if we assume that the extension is abelian, then this is known. So taking these two cases as the input, we can use that uh, compatibilities that I mentioned before. And we can use the research to, to uh, generalize this to any one dimensional scheme. But in particular, in this way, we obtain these formulas for schemes that are not necessarily regular, right? So we can have some really funny uh, examples. Uh, we can glue starting from the uh, number rings and starting from curves over finite fields. We can actually glue some, some um, one-dimensional schemes that will have some some uh, irregular irregularities, right? So this is the first result that we have. Then I wanted to to make this explicit and write down uh, what what kind of cohomology groups we have actually. You know? So um, this is a consequence of some known calculations of uh, motivic cohomology. We can show that for a one-dimensional uh, scheme, this uh, version of motivic cohomology that I am using, it will be concentrated in the interesting part, basically will be concentrated in degrees minus one, zero, and one. So we will have some uh, finitely generated group in degree minus one. We will have two groups in degree zero and one. And then starting from degree two, we will just have some finite to torsion group. So, but basically the idea is the following that the arithmetically interesting part sits in degree minus one, zero, and one. And this uh, finite to torsion, it just comes from the real points of our scheme. So it's, it's not very interesting. You know? And then I wanted to write down what, is, what this valid cohomology will look like for this uh, particular example. So it will be just concentrated in degrees uh, one, two, and three. In degree one, we will just have some free part which comes from the from this uh, uh, equivalent cohomology of the complex points, and then we will have some finite part which will come from this uh, um, etal motivic cohomology in degree one. Then in degree two, we will have also some free part of the same rank that will come from the etal motivic cohomology in degree minus one, and then we will have some finite part which comes from the etal motivic cohomology in degree zero. And finally, in degree three, we will have some um, finite group, which comes from the uh, etal motivic cohomology in degree minus one, the torsion part of the group. You know? So um, I think this example, why, why am I writing these uh, explicit formulas? It's to show that uh, at the end, these uh, uh, very little uh, cohomologies will somehow it's it's somehow built out of the uh, 
epidemiologic homology of uh, of uh, our skin. So this is the particular calculation that is one can uh, one can do in case of uh, one dimensional skin, right? So basically, it's, this is uh, what this is how it looks like more or less. And then, well, one can make everything really explicit in this case, and one can write down a formula. So one can write down a formula in terms of these cohomology groups uh, in degrees, uh, this etal motivic cohomology in degree minus one, zero, and one, and in terms of a regulator. So this is a formula that generalizes the, um, the class number formula that I mentioned before. It generalizes this uh, uh, Lichtenbaum's cohomological conjecture. And uh, one can show that uh, this formula actually holds for any uh, one dimensional uh, scheme uh, if it is abelian. And we conjecture that this is actually true for non abelian uh, one dimensional schemes. But um, this is basically something that is not known it's uh, it's uh, it's a difficult conjecture but yeah i mean i don't know if you like this this kind of explicit formulas but coming from number theory i i really like this kind of specific examples okay and then another example of uh, new results that one can obtain one can obtain these uh, special value conjectures for cellular schemes. So uh, by a cellular scheme over some base B, I mean a scheme that admits a filtration by close of schemes, such that in this uh, chain of, in this filtration, the corresponding complements uh, will be, uh, will correspond to like gluing uh, cells that are correspond to affine spaces over the base B. So uh, the other result is that uh, if we have a cellular uh, scheme over a one-dimensional abelian base, uh, then uh, assuming that it has a smooth complex fiber, then we can prove that uh, this vanishing order conjecture and the uh, special order conjecture actually hold unconditionally for any negative n. But uh, one can imagine how this proof goes like. It's because of we I already mentioned that the conjectures are uh, compatible with these uh, taking close-up schemes, taking disjoint unions, and taking affine bundles. So basically, using that, one can proceed by the visage and uh, uh, come down to the to the base B. And as I already mentioned, for uh, one-dimensional abelian schemes, it's already known. And uh, well, yeah, so basically that's um, more or less it. I don't know if there are some questions at this point. Well, maybe I will mention some of my questions and then uh, somehow can make uh, their questions and comments regarding the whole presentation. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I may uh, I may ask a question on this okay. previous slide on this large stuff. Um? Can you prove it? Yes, yeah, yeah. Just precisely about this cellular case. So, uh -huh. can you prove anything if uh, the scheme is not cellular but becomes cellular after some atelier based change, such like that? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, I mean, say kind of uh, severe Brouwer variety or you know, split quadric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I see. I see what what, what you mean. Basically, um, yeah, that's that's something that one would really want to to have, but uh, it is not clear uh, how the zeta function uh, behaves uh, in this uh, situation, right? Um, if we if we have this this something like um, like a finite tile cover or something like that, then 
it is not clear how this special value conjecture behaves under this. So basically, because of this, uh, no, I, I I really work only with these kind of uh, cellular schemes, uh, and not with the case, the more general situation that you 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 are mentioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, ideally, what, what one would would want to prove uh, precisely what you say, but uh, at yeah. the at this point, we have only only this kind of stuff. Yeah, just a very particular question of this kind. Uh, can you prove for anything? everything for yeah. say uh, a quadric without rational points something like that or a very small quadric i mean uh, yeah that would be one dimensional uh, quadric yeah without rational points yeah it would be i think it would be interesting to, to consider some particular cases before uh, trying to prove maybe the, something to the general yeah at this point, this what I what I have is, is just what is here in this, uh, in this slide. Mm -hmm. okay. um, are there uh, are there any questions related to 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 this part before I I well I finish with with my questions? Well, um, okay, so this will be really quick. I will just mention, so I just, I talked about this uh, kind of uh, activity uh, around uh, Veletali cohomology. I said how to, how more or less it, does it look like, no? How, how to, um, how we can write down this, special value formulas in terms of these cohomology groups. Then I gave some examples and some particular cases that are uh, that were like previously not known. Uh, and uh, we can deduce them by Devisage using using our formalism. And uh, I will quickly mention some uh, open questions that I consider well for myself for the subsequent research. So I was talking about the um, the negative uh, integers. This is because somehow the special values at positive integers, if we consider a non-regular scheme, in this case is, is more difficult. So already if we take something like a non-maximal order inside of a number field, it's already an interesting case to think about how to properly construct these cohomology groups and how to formulate the um, the proper special, the correct special value conjecture. So even for non-maximal orders, it's it's already something interesting. Um, then there was some really mm, mm, weird uh, uh, assumption that was appearing mm, almost everywhere that we want the complex fiber of our scheme to be smooth. But this is because the regulators, I use a construction of Kerr, Lewis, and Miller stuff. Usually the regulators are defined only for smooth complex varieties. So this is why we take the base change to C. Uh, we assume that it's smooth, and then we we use as a black box this uh, regulator construction. Actually, it is possible to extend the regulators to non-smooth uh, varieties. It was uh, somehow done by Karen Lewis later, but it is not actually clear how to uh, connect all this machinery of regulators for non-smooth varieties to the arithmetic situation and how would it work, right? So this is another question, how to remove this kind of assumption of generic smoothness of uh, X. So I, am, I was saying that X is uh, something that can be non-regular, but at the same time, I'm asking that the generic fiber of X should be regular, should be smooth, a smooth variety. So basically I'm allowing some kind of singularities in the process, but I don't allow these singularities to be too bad to, to spoil the smoothness of the generic fiber. So this is the, the kind of uh, issue. So obviously one would like to, to work with any kind of scheme, but the problem at this point is that we don't have uh, a good uh, 
uh, idea about the regulators in the, in the non-smooth case. Then another question, well, uh, I was mentioning at some points the Tamagawa number conjecture. And actually this special value conjecture, when the comparison makes sense, it's equivalent to the Tamagawa number conjecture. And there is also some refinement of the Tamagawa number conjecture, which is called equivariant Tamagawa number conjecture. And it will be interesting to also to refine this kind of conjecture that I have to compare it to the equivariant Tamagawa number conjecture. And then um, I didn't give the construction of these varietal complexes because, well, I already uh, spent a lot of time, I think, in this talk. And uh, it would be really too technical to, 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 to give the definition. But basically, this, this definition is really ad hoc. So one would like to have some more canonical and tutorial construction of these uh, varietal complexes. But at this point, we just have some um, ad hoc construction. So this is another question. OK. And yeah, well, there are many other uh, related questions to all this business. There are many ramifications. But I think I won't talk about this anymore. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's time to stop. So thank you. Thank you very much.